And we're going to break the word of life this morning. And so I'm going to pray for Kevin, and then we're going to uh, be blessed to hear him teach the word this morning. Father, thanks for my bro. I just pray that you will fill him with your spirit, speak through his mouth, empower and enlighten his mind as he teaches. And Lord, may we be ready to receive what you have through him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You guys hear me good? I love uh, guest teaching at this church. It's a wonderful church. Last time I spoke here, there's probably about 25% of the crowd that's here today. And uh, so I, the, the way I figure it is after I get done teaching, the church grows by 300%. And kind of, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next time I come when there's, uh, you know, 300% more of you guys. So I think Russ, Russ picked a good uh, guest speaker. But... Uh, no, I'm just joking. But the first time I came here to speak, they said I could speak on anything I wanted, you know. Jump in, pick anything you want, grab a scripture. The, the pulpit is yours. You have freedom. And I thought, man, this is a great Russ. That guy's awesome. And this time he says, I want you to teach on Revelation, all right? There you go, buddy. <laughs> Revelation. What an amazing thing. Uh, it's a challenging book, and I hope we're all challenged this morning as uh, we look at the book of Revelation. I think maybe the lights are, have gone out, but... Yeah, that's the other challenge. And when I preach, the lights just go out. That's how awesome it is. Um, I want to tell you guys a story. Uh, this week is the one-year anniversary of the greatest expedition I've ever gone on. Me and my wife were missionaries in the Philippines for three years. Uh, we had a wonderful time there. And uh, one year ago to this week, I got to lead um, a group of young pastors on a missions trip into the jungle tribes uh, in the mountains of the, the Philippines, in the southern Philippines. This is the region that is dominated by Muslim extremists, uh, lots of terrorism. There were bombings in the, in the city that I went to. And uh, we, we had a mission trip to bring the gospel to a tribe up in a jungle. The hike we went on was, was probably equal to two, two times the South Sisters hike. Any of you guys have ever done that before? It's about two times that hike. And we were getting ready to go on this, this adventure to bring rice, Bibles, and a gospel presentation to the tribe called the Madabo tribe uh, in the Philippine mountains. And we had to hike through rivers. And as we were getting packed up, I began to strap on, you know, my sleeping bag. And, and I got some, a big sack of rice to carry. And uh, one of the, the guides that was guiding us, he strapped two shotguns to my backpack. And I'm thinking, oh, uh, what kind of hike is this? And uh, he said, he said, here's exactly how he said it. He said, Pastor, this is a warring tribe, Pastor. And I thought, what? <laughs> We're going on a hike. I'm bringing my students on a hike to a tribe that's at war. And uh, so we had these two shotguns. There's a young lady uh, in our Bible college. She had a shotgun. I was thinking, what is this? And uh, we get up there. We didn't have any problems. Um, we, we hiked and hiked and hiked, and we finally got through the jungle, through the rivers, to this tribe. And the, the remarkable thing about this tribe that blew my mind is that their village, a bunch of small huts, is located right on the edge of a cliff. Literally, there is a cliff with a giant river below it, and, and their huts are right on the edge of this cliff. And I thought, that has got to be the worst placement. You know, whoever the real estate agent for this tribe is, that guy is a nut. And... Uh, we got to bed, we had a good time, uh, fellowship, and in the morning they explained to us, the reason we're on this cliff is because this cliff is full of gold. This tribe had figured out that these hills, the, these, this jungle mountain, was full of gold. The biggest city near where we were is called Cagayan de Oro, which is river of gold. And uh, they figured out a way to start harvesting gold from this cliff. And so they figured, well, we'll put our village right here, right on this cliff, right on the edge, so we can get the gold out, we can trade, we can make money, we can get rice, we can do different things for our tribe, we can join the modern world. They were right next to the gold. These people lived on the edge, and I think about Christianity a lot of, are we people who live on the edge? Are we people who, who, who live on the cliff so that we can get that gold that Jesus promises? This morning we sang a song that said, I'm tired of lukewarm living. I'm tired of compromising. I'm ready to be a, a person who lives on the cliff, who lives on the edge. If you guys are tired of lukewarm living, and if you're ready to live on the edge and find that gold that Jesus has for us, I want you guys to stand up with me this morning as we pray. Let's ask the Lord just to, to let the word come alive to us this morning. 
Lord, we stand united that we're tired of lukewarm living. We're ready to be uh, people who live on the edge, people who, who dwell on the cliffs, who are just very extreme for you, Lord, people who are ready to give our lives to you. Be the center of this church, be the center of our lives, and teach us from your word today, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You guys have a seat. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14. This is a section about a church that had a problem. And the way Jesus deals with this problem is uh, he deals with it as a doctor. Basically, we're going to have health class this morning. He's going to kind of break it into four sections. And the first section is... Jesus, as the doctor, is going to give his credentials. The great physician is going to say, I'm worthy to work on you guys, to operate, to do surgery on this unhealthy church because of this and this. So that's the first part. The second part is he's going to say, here's why you're sick. Here's what's wrong with you. The third part is he's going to say, here's the medicine you need. And then the fourth part of our study this morning, Jesus is going to say, if you take my medicine, if you take my advice, if you listen to my credentials as a doctor, Here's how well you can become. Here's the reward you can receive. And so we're just going to get right into it right now. Let me read to you verses 14 through 22. Chapter 3 of Revelation. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have, uh, and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do, not know that, and do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, to put on white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and that you should anoint your eyes with the eye salve so that you can see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with the Father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, let him hear it. This is a lukewarm church. This is a very simple section of scripture, but the depth is so, so amazing. This church was, was unhealthy because it was lukewarm. And I, and I honestly, I don't like the term lukewarm because what does it mean? Let's describe that term. We're going to attempt to do that today. Let me give you a little bit of background about this church of Laodicea. You know, it's the final church to be dealt with in the first couple chapters here of Revelation. And many have said, because it's the final church, chronologically, it's showing the most modern church in human history. And some have said, this is today's church. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but we can learn a lot from this church. I've learned a lot from this church, and we will this morning. Laodicea was founded probably 250 years before the birth of Christ. So it's, it's got some history. The city is rich. Um, it, 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 it's seen its hardships like any city. But uh, for the most part, it's a very wealthy place. Now, Laodicea means justice of the people. It was named after a, a ruler's wife. Antiochus was a great ruler, and his wife was named uh, Laodice. And her name means uh, justice of the people. And so he named the city after her. You know, wouldn't you love your husband to name a city after you? They had uh, three things that characterized this city. Uh, they were a banking industry city. They were right in the middle of a trade route, so they began to develop a system of loans. They were kind of the Bank of America, the Welsh Fargo of Asia Minor, and this made them very wealthy. Anytime you get into banking, you start figuring out how interest works and loans, there's a lot of money to be made, and this city figured it out. And where there's money, you also have the best stuff. They had the best clothing. They had the best buildings. They also had the best medicine. There was a very famous school of medicine in this place. This city had it all, and the church took great pleasure in the wealth of this city. Paul even speaks a little bit about this city. He never visited this city, but in his message to the Colossians, he said, share this with the Laodiceans. Share this with the Laodiceans. I loved what uh, little Sarah said this morning about the supremacy of Christ. 
I thought, man, we should just have her up here speaking the word all morning. Because that's what we're going to talk about, the supremacy of Christ. So let's get into this. And the first part of our health class is to see the credentials of this doctor, Jesus, the great physician, who's going to deal with the problem of lukewarm in this church. Let's look at verses 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Christ first introduces himself as the Amen. That's kind of a strange name, isn't it? The Amen. We usually don't use Amen as a name. Amen is, is as you guys know, it's a Hebrew word, but we never translate the word. We just go ahead and say it in, in the Bible. We say it every day in our prayers. It's just a Hebrew word that simply means, so be it. Or more specifically, complete and final truth. This is the end all. And Jesus is calling himself, I am the complete, I am the final truth. I am all there is. I am the end to every question you have. I am the, the fulfillment, I am success, I am the, the best education. Anything that is out there that is good and right, Jesus is the final complete truth. He is the fulfillment of that. And so he wants these people to know, there is nothing besides me. The Beatles saying, all you need is love. Jesus says, all you need is me. That's all you need. The complete, the final, the truth. You know, I, in Bible college, uh, there's a young man in here who went to Bible college with me. And many nights we'd sit around tables and we'd discuss theology. We'd discuss, uh, you know, Calvinism versus Arminianism. We'd discuss all these amazing themes. And we'd get in these large conversations and, and be frustrated and, and excited. And every once in a while, somebody would come by and they'd kind of listen to our conversation and be like, huh, ah, the answer there is fix your eyes on Jesus. And they'd just kind of walk away. And we'd sit there and we'd think, that guy's right. Every argument, every conversation, every problem we found in Scripture, the answer was always Jesus is the final complete truth. That's what this word amen means when they call that to Jesus here. Again, let me remind you, he's giving his credentials as a doctor to heal this church. He also goes on to call himself the, the faithful and true witness. The faithful and true witness. Um, it's amazing that not only is he the complete source of all truth, not only is he the exact representation of God, the revelation of perfection, but he's faithful to share that with us. Isn't that amazing? Not only do we have the resource of Jesus Christ, the leader of this church is complete truth, but he says, I'm willing to share it with you and open it up to you every day. I'm willing to give it to you guys every day. What a resource we have in Jesus, the faithful and true witness. Again, he goes on to describe his credentials. He says, I'm the beginning of creation. Now, he says, I'm the beginning of creation. It doesn't mean he is uh, the first created. Jesus wasn't created. It means all creation starts with him. Anything that was or is or is to come starts with Jesus. Why? Because he is the creator. He is the master. He has authority over everything. Every physical thing, every spiritual thing, he also has authority over every theory, every thought. He is complete, final truth. He's the beginning of creation. If we stopped there, that's enough to heal a church, isn't it? I mean, we don't even need to say anything else, do we? Besides the fact that Jesus is all there is. You know, he is the leader of our church. If we fix our eyes on him, we're going to be just fine. We could stop right there, but we're, we're going to keep going. Jesus has established himself as the authority, the final and truth. Amazing thing. Now, at this point in, the, in, in speaking of the churches in this section in Revelation, Jesus would, he would give them a commendation. He would give them a positive encouragement, something that would kind of lift their spirits. Some of the churches, he said, you have life. Some of them, he says, you are faithful. But with this particular church, Jesus has nothing good to say. And so as the doctor, he's going to skip that part. You know, when he comes into the, 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 the waiting room, he says, I've got good news and bad news for most of the churches. But this church, he says, I've just got bad news. I don't have any good news for you guys. I don't have anything good to say about you. There's something unique about this church. It's separate. It's different. And Jesus is going to get right into their problem. What makes them unhealthy? Go to verses 15 through 17. 
Jesus says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and yet you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus says, I know your works. I know your motives. I know your thoughts. I know everything you think of. I know your actions. I know your home groups. I know everything that you guys do. I know it all. I know your works, and they're bad works. He doesn't have anything good to say about this church. They're bad works. He sees everything. He's letting them know, you guys can't hide anything from me. He says, you're lukewarm. You're lukewarm. What does that mean, lukewarm? There's a description of what truly lukewarm is uh, coming up in a couple verses, but I just want you to think about the word lukewarm. It basically means kind of comfortable, kind of plain, just kind of run of the mill. When uh, I go to Fantastic Sam's to get a haircut, the lady loves to, to wash your hair there and you get to tilt your head back in the bowl. She's not gonna put the water on very hot because then she'll burn you, you'll sue them, they'll be done, you'll be rich. <laughs> She's not gonna put it on freezing cold, you know, that's not comfortable. What she does is she kind of finds a lukewarm temperature so that you can relax. And you know, I'll be honest, when those ladies wash my hair at Fantastic Sam's, that's one of the best feelings in the world. You know, when you're sitting back there and someone's massaging your scalp, that lukewarm water, I mean, you could fall asleep. And uh, I kind of see lukewarm in that sense, is it's just relaxing. It's not uncomfortable, it's very relaxing. You kind of relax, you're peaceful, and yet Jesus says, that turns my stomach. That makes me sick. Another description of lukewarm is, is uh, my wife says, the best description of, of something that's gross lukewarm is coffee. You know, cold coffee, that's the biggest thing that ever hit the United States. You know, what do they call them, frappuccinos? You know, you guys know Starbucks. Warm coffee, there's nothing like it. I'm sure many of you would say, you know, that classic joke, if I don't have my coffee in the morning, you know, it's awesome. But lukewarm coffee is just disgusting. You know, it's just kind of right there in the middle. Nobody wants it lukewarm. Heat that up, cool it down. It doesn't taste good. Well, Jesus is kind of hitting on that same point. There's nothing good about being lukewarm. Matter of fact, I wish you were either cold or hot. That's a weird thing to say. How many of you are parents? Raise your hand. Okay, well, lots of parents. Wouldn't you rather your kid be lukewarm than cold? You know, I, I, I think of, I work with high schoolers all day in a youth ministry in Redmond, and I think of, I, I would love for 90% of them to be lukewarm than, the, than how cold they are. You know, to, 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 to be dealing drugs, to be in a relationship they shouldn't be in, oh, it's tough to see. But if they were just kind of not getting in trouble, run of the mill, not doing too much good, but not doing too much bad, man, that would be like a victory in my ministry. I would be like, Lord, you're doing a work. <laughs> However, we're not talking about a bunch of unsaved high schoolers here. Jesus is talking about the church of Jesus Christ. He's saying the church that I am in and the church that is in me cannot be lukewarm, cannot be middle ground, cannot be just sitting comfortable. I would rather you be cold or hot. Matter of fact, it makes me want to vomit. He likens a lukewarm church to vomit. You know, granted, the vomit of Jesus Christ is probably the most beautiful substance in the world. <laughs> but vomit, the whole point here is it's disgusting. It's full of acid and filth. It's regurgitated food. That's the point Jesus is trying to make. Lukewarmity. The status of a church that is lukewarm makes him sick. He doesn't tolerate it. And you say, Lord, wouldn't you rather us be lukewarm than cold? And he says, not my church. Not my church. That's deceiving. That's not who represents me. Didn't you just hear me describe myself as the end of every discussion, the complete and final truth? I can't stand lukewarmness. We'll get a better description of what the, their lukewarm problem was here in uh, verse 17. Let's check this out. He says, You're lukewarm because you say this, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Their biggest problem that made them lukewarm is that they thought they were good. 
They thought, man, our banking industry is going well. Our clothing industry is going well. We've got a, a magnificent medical school here that brings wealth to our community and gives us health. We don't need anything. We are doing just fine. They really believe they don't need anything. But I'm here to say today that I need Jesus Christ so bad. I need him so bad. I'm wearing on my hand a, uh, a uh, ribbon. And this ribbon, Redmond uh, community has come together to, to, to pray against child abuse. And we're wearing these at the high school. We're wearing these in, in churches because we want to come against child abuse this month. And uh, let me tell you why I need Jesus Christ. Because last week I was counseling a young lady and she came to me and said that her father had raped her. And I'll tell you what, Kevin Wright, Pastor Kevin Wright, guest speaker Kevin Wright has nothing to offer this girl. I can't offer her anything. I don't have the words to say. I don't have the bandage to heal her wound. I don't have the, the, the elegant words to soothe her pain. I have nothing but Jesus Christ. He can fix her completely. And so for a church to say, we have need of nothing. Our wealth has kept us stable. The Lord says that makes me sick. Because we need Jesus Christ so much every day. Pastor Russ cannot get up here and share the word of, word of God with you without Jesus Christ. You home group leaders cannot change the lives of this church without Jesus Christ. Without his complete and final truth that he gives us every day. The church says we don't need anything. We're doing just fine. If our church ever says that, look out. Look out. Look out for the rain of vomit. <laughs> I have need of nothing. But that's the Lord's re rebuke. You say you have need of nothing. You say your wealth has kept you good. You have beautiful buildings. That makes you comfortable. One of the things about this church that, that blesses my heart is that we just meet in a school. I talked to Pastor Russ. I said, Russ, tell me about your, your building plans. Tell me about this. Because I'm about to teach on, on uh, building, so you better have a good answer. And he said, he said, I just love meeting in the school, and, and, and we're going to do it for a while. And there's nothing wrong with having a church building of your own. There's many benefits and many blessings. But it shouldn't be the focus. It should never come to the point where your building allows you to say, dude, we don't need anything else. We don't need to go forward. We don't need to go out into the world. We're comfy here in our lukewarm building. Building is one thing. What about wealth? What about wealth itself? What about what's in your wallet? There's nothing in my wallet right now, so I can preach properly this morning. <laughs> Does wealth have a tendency to, to replace the need for Jesus Christ's power in our lives? I, I guarantee you it does. I guarantee you it does. Um, I've been getting into eBay. I love eBay. It's a great way to make some money and also lose some money. And... Uh, uh, I found a, you know, a way to find some antiques and sell them on eBay and, and, and some different things. And, and one time I put together a set of antiques, just kind of on a whim, and I put it on eBay, and I made an obscene amount of money for it. I thought, I'm going to quit my job. This is amazing. And I got this big chunk of cash, and I'm sitting there and thinking, I'm untouchable. I can do whatever I want. And for about 10 minutes, I thought, man, this is life changing. All it was was a, a wad of worthless cash. But you know, that's a small example of how, how wealth can take over in our lives. It can start to, to kick Jesus out. It can start to box him out of the key. And so that we become reliant upon it. You know, I, I met a uh, pastor in the Philippines one time. You know, this guy was a great preacher, a uh, solid brother. And uh, I asked him a question. I said, so you know, what's the next step for the church? And his first answer was, well, depending on how much money we have. I forgot what he said, but that stuck with me. Depending on how much money we have. Do we make our deci decisions as a church based on how much money we have? You know, uh, there, there are so many things that Christ can give us that money cannot give us. And the Laodiceans were missing it. The Laodiceans were, were saying... We have need of nothing because we are wealthy. We have need of nothing because we are healthy. We have need of nothing because we look good. But they needed Jesus so bad. They needed his complete and final truth. 
Jesus says, not only are you not wealthy, matter of fact, you're poor. You're spiritually poor. You have no substance. You guys are weak, spiritually poor. He also says, you're wretched. This, this word literally, it means ugly, homely. The church should be beautiful, represent, representing Jesus Christ, and yet, he says, you're wretched. You stink. You're ugly to look at. You cause vomit. It also says you're miserable. They thought they were doing good. They thought they were good because wealth had kept them strong. But really in their hearts, Christ says, you're miserable. How many of you can say, just being wealthy sometimes is miserable? You know, if you have wealth without Jesus Christ, it is miserable. How many of you guys know who Christian Slater is? Christian Slater, okay, this is dating a little bit because he's kind of the actor I grew up with in the, in the 80s a little bit. He made a great skateboard movie. Uh, he was just kind of the man. And at the height of his career, they interviewed him and they said, Christian Slater, you got it all. You're dating a supermodel. You just signed a million dollar movie deal. You're the best there is. You know, tell us, you know, about your life. And, he, and the first thing that came out of his mouth, he said, I'm miserable. I thought, what? Slater! <laughs> Slater, you're the man. How can you be miserable? I want your life, Slater. He said, I'm miserable. There's something missing. And the, the guy who was interviewing him said, you just got a million dollar movie deal. He said, money means nothing. You're still miserable. I can't believe he was saying this. I was like, record this. This is right out of the word of God. Christ said, you have wealth, you have comfort, you have compromise, but you're miserable. It's not going to bring true happiness. It's a crazy thing. You're poor when you should be spiritually wealthy. You're ugly when you should be spiritually beautiful. You're miserable when you spiritually you should be full of joy. He also says one thing that, that man, he says you're blind. Wealth has made you blind. Your status, your lukewarmness has made you blind. Now, it doesn't mean physically blind. It means spiritually blind. What does it mean to be spiritually blind? You know, honestly, I hate being a guest teacher today because this is a crazy message. But spiritually blind means you can't figure anything out spiritually. You can't get vision. You can't see the next step. You can't understand the teachings of Jesus Christ. You can't navigate through the Word of God. You can't see the invisible. You can't know the spiritual realm because you're spiritually blinded because wealth is taking Christ's place in your life. That was the problem with the church of Laodicea. Spiritually blind. You're blind. You think you see so clearly. You think you've got it nailed. You're blind. I remember a time when I was spiritually blind. I remember a time when, when the Word of God meant nothing to me. It was a book. It was a, a collection of great sayings. But the Lord got a hold of me one night while I was playing football. It changed my life forever. And it was as if my eyes became open to the Word of God. I, I loved it. I began reading it, studying it. I gave up a football scholarship so that I could go to Bible college. And, and the Word of God just became everything to me. And, and I thought, man, this is it's a night and day difference. It's as if somebody gave me some kind of goggles so that I could finally see the Word of God. Not only did I begin to see the Word of God, but I began to see the invisible realm. Now, before you guys think I'm some kind of nut, doesn't mean I was, you know, seeing the demons and the angels and all this. But I began to see everything from a spiritual perspective. I began to, you know, when, when a person was hurting or when sadness was taking over a family, I knew there's a spiritual attack there. You know, I, I, I and, and you guys experience the same thing. But when you're spiritually blind, you have no clue about that kind of stuff. That was the church of Laodicea. Sad, sad place to be. A sad, sad place to be. One question that we need to ask ourselves all the time is, how do we measure health in our church? How do we measure it? If you talk to somebody and they say, oh, we've got 500 people. Our church is doing great. That's not a good measurement of health. Oh, our congregation's wealthy. You know, uh, tithing's going great. That's not a measurement of spiritual health. How do we measure it? How do we do that? The simplest answer to that, the most uh, revolutionary thing in my life, 
is where is Christ at the head of this church? How much supremacy, as young Heather said, or young Sarah, how much supremacy does Christ take in our lives and in our church? That's how you measure health in a church. I, uh, when I first got married, somebody said, so you're going to be a pastor someday? I said, yeah, yeah I'm going to be a pastor. He goes, you want to plant a church? And I said, I already got one. I got my first member right here. <laughs> and uh, I really thought of it like that. I thought, man, this is great. The Lord, you know, my congregation's always going to be full. And, uh, but the key in my family, me and my wife, the key is, where is Christ? Is he right in the center? Is he above wealth? Is he above everything? That's how you measure health in a church. We're going to come to a verse here at the end of this section, which is the most difficult verse, I believe, in the entire Bible. And uh, it's going to answer every question about lukewarmness. It's going to answer how to avoid it. But it's a terrible answer. It's a difficult answer. Is Christ the sinner? Let's go to verses 18 and 19. Christ has given his credentials as a, as a doctor. He's saying, I'm worthy to fix you guys. I'm worthy to be the center of your life, the head of the church. Secondly, he says, here's your problem. I've diagnosed, I've took the x-rays. Look what's wrong with you. And now he's going to say, here's the medicine you need to take. Let's read verses 18 and 19. It says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire. Gold refined in the fire. What does that mean? I counsel you to buy for me gold. The first thing you, you want to think of is, these people's problem was wealth. Why would Christ say, I counsel you to get more wealth? He's saying, get spiritual wealth. Get spiritual gold. Now the question is, how do you get this gold that's been refined in the fire, that's been tested and true? What's the word that Jesus says? How do they get it? They have to do what? Buy it. They have to buy it. It's not free. Salvation, justification, that's free. But falling in love with Jesus every day, putting him as the center of your life, it costs something. You've got to buy that gold. This church had everything. They had foundation. They had a good pastor. They had a, a, a church plant that was thriving. The money was there. And yet they needed to buy gold. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Peter had some insight to this, and, and you can look at this scripture later in, in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. He says, gold, this refined gold, is faith. Faith that's tested and true. This church had lost its faith. They put faith in money, circumstance, finance, building, people. And they had lost their faith in Jesus Christ. They had lost the power in Jesus Christ. Buy from me, he says, gold refined in the fire. In other words, grab on to faith. Start walking in your faith in me like you did at the first. Buy that. It's expensive, though. Faith is very expensive because you've got to count the cost. You know what a great description of faith is? Is... Uh, in Luke 9, 23, when Christ said, Deny yourself daily, take up your cross, and follow me. That's not free. That's a huge cost. Deny yourself daily. That's how you buy refined gold. I remember when I first started to grasp that idea of denying yourself daily. That, that was the worst lesson I learned. The most difficult lesson. Deny yourself every day. Deny yourself every day. Put yourself down. I... Uh, did some marriage counseling in the Philippines and a young man came to me and said, so what's the key to a happy marriage? You know, what is the, the just give me one sentence, just sum it up for me. And, and I was trying to sound like a smart teacher. I'm like, oh man, I got to win this guy's heart. I got to represent right now for all those married men out there. And I told him, take your dreams and flush them down the toilet and find the dreams of your wife and strap them on your back. And I thought, good job, Kev. It just came to me. <laughs> but you know what? That's what denying yourself daily is about. Not only putting aside physical things, not only putting aside uh, material things, but dreams. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. My dream is to be a movie director. You know, Steven Spielberg, I love that guy. 
I wanted to be in Hollywood. That was my dream. I still, in the back of my mind, think it's going to happen someday. But denying yourself daily means putting aside everything that hinders your relationship with Christ, hinders you from following Christ, even if it's a dream. That's a crazy thing. Placing my hopes and dreams in your hands. Wow. My hopes and dreams. I, I talked to some single people. We got any singles in here tonight? This morning, I mean. We got some singles. A lot of single people are looking forward to getting married. Some are saying, I'm not looking forward. But a lot of them are. The hope of marriage is something to place in Christ's hands. The hope of, of having children is something to place in Christ's hands. And that faith, that step, that denying of yourself is buying this gold refined in the fire. Laodicean stopped doing that. And it made Christ vomit. The second thing he says, put on the, the white garments. You guys are naked. Spiritually, you're, you're, you're exposed and, and you're ashamed to the rest of the world. To me, you, you, look, you look naked. Put on white garments. What are these white garments? You'll find out later in the, in the book of Revelation and elsewhere in Scripture, these white garments speak of the righteousness of Christ. You see, when Christ died on the cross for our sins, rose again in power, resurrection power, reigns at the, the right hand of God, mediates for us daily as our high priest. He says, the things I've done, the righteousness I've secured, my perfect life, I now put on you as my church. What an amazing thing. But the Laodiceans were not walking in that. They had rejected that. They had put that aside. They had said, we don't need to walk in the righteousness of Christ. We have our own righteousness. We have need of nothing. We are strong. And yet we need to walk in the righteousness of Christ every day. Let me tell you why this is important. You say, oh, it's great, Kev. Walking in the righteousness of Christ means you don't stand in the condemnation of sin anymore. You are free from it, and now you stand in completeness, in unity, in fellowship with God the Father because of the righteousness of Christ. His perfection, His beauty, His honor is placed on us now. And that is a white garment that hides our naked shame spiritually. But the Laodiceans had stopped walking in that. Think about how we can get back to walking in the righteousness of Christ. It gives me power, I'll tell you what. Knowing that sin has no hold over me. Sin has no command in my life. Because Christ's righteousness is the robe I wear. The Laodiceans had set that aside and said, we don't need that. Buy gold refined in the fire. Access that faith. Get back with the Lord. Put on the garments of His righteousness. And the third thing it says here, you guys need eye salve. You need medicine for your eyes because you're spiritually blind. You need, you need to, to see things the way they are. You need to get back in control of your life. You guys are gone. You're out. A lot of people have said that this verse clearly is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Are we a church that walks in the Holy Spirit? Because if you are, you're going to see clearly the Word of God. Laodiceans had rejected that. If you're walking in the Spirit, if He is our guide, if He is our sight, we're going to make decisions for our church that are going to change the world. Laodiceans were focused on themselves. They had given up on missions. Today, the, the church of Laodiceans has no legacy at all. It's been done for years. Because they were spiritually blind. Christ says, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Christ was a great example of that. Remember when Christ was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove? In Matthew, early in the, early in the Gospel of Matthew. Immediately it says the Spirit led him. The Spirit led him. He had the, he had the sight. Laodiceans had lost that. They needed to get their sight back. The medicine for these people was to buy gold refined in the fire, put on white garments, and get some medicine on your stinking blind eyes. In other words, have faith in Christ, the complete truth. Walk in His righteousness and let the Holy Spirit guide you as a church or else I'm going to vomit. That was the medicine they needed. That was the rebuke they needed. After this, Christ goes on to say, if you take that medicine, here's what will happen. 
Let's go to verses 20 through 21. Oh, in verse 19, he, he just to kind of tack that on at the end, he says, So, in light of this, be zealous and repent. You're not zealous. You're not excited. You're not fiery. You're not hot. Get that way and change. Some people say, this is a, talking about a church that's not saved. I don't agree with that. This is a church that has a foundation in Christ. It's clear because Christ, he says, all you need to do here is get on fire again and change. Change your ways. Change your habits. That's what repent means. Go to verses 20 through 21. We're getting close to the most difficult verse in Scripture of all time ever. So get ready for it, guys. In verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. Verse 20, Christ is basically saying, I am outside of you guys. Laodicea, I am outside of your church. You guys have built a comfortable, lukewarm bath in your beautiful building with your beautiful clothes and your awesome medicine, your rich banking system, your so-called integrity-filled church, but I am outside of it. Christ needs to be inside. And all he says here is, I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I'm knocking. Are you going to let me in? The answer to lukewarm, the problem of being lukewarm is let Christ in. It's as simple as that. It doesn't get any more theological than that. Make Christ the supremacy. I mean, what the young lady said in her verse this morning was perfect. Christ is everything. He is the supremacy. He is the answer to a lukewarm problem. Now, how do you make him the center? How do you let him in? How can we have that fellowship he talks about here? How do we do that? We need each other. We need the Holy Spirit. And here's how you do it. It's very simple. Give Christ supremacy in your life. If wealth is, is dominant in your life, if you make your decisions based on wealth, if wealth causes you to, to act a certain way in church, Kick that out. Let Christ cause you to act a certain way in church. If wealth makes your, your decisions uh, in your family, get rid of that. Let Christ make the decisions in your family. This is the key to not being lukewarm. He wants to come in and have fellowship. He's ready for this church, but he's on the outside. Let's think together as a church real quick. Is Christ on the inside or the outside of us? Is he on the inside of the, or the outside? Let's think together as individuals. Is Christ on the inside or the outside of your life? Is Christ on the inside? Is he knocking right now? Because every time I read this verse, he knocks to me. He's knocking right now. I want to be on the inside. I want to fellowship with you, Kevin. I want to sit and dine. I want to have that close fellowship that me and the Father have. I want that with you every day. If you hear that knocking, a change might need to be made. Now, here's how we do it all. This is not the answer I like, but this is the answer. The most difficult verse I believe in the entire Bible. Here it goes, guys. Get ready for it. Verse 21. Here's how you wrap this all together. Here's how you get rid of lukewarmness. Here's how you let Christ be supreme in your life. Here's how you access that complete and final truth that he is. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You say, oh, what's the big deal about that verse? Think about this. If you overcome, you will be on fire. You will fellowship with Christ. You will be with him reigning and ruling when he comes back to, to rule this world. Now, how, how are we supposed to overcome? What does this verse tell us? How, how, how do we overcome? What's the way to do it? Somebody say it loud. What does it say? Like Jesus. like Jesus did. Like Jesus did. Now, the next question. What did Jesus overcome? He overcame death. What else did he overcome? Sin. Sin. Self. Temptation. Basically what this verse is saying is the reward is there for those who will do what Jesus did. Overcome just as I have overcome. 
Now, why is this the hardest verse in the Bible? Because the life that Jesus led, it wasn't one of wealth at all. And I'm not, I can't sugarcoat this message because I know this is real and this is true. Christians don't want to hear that living this life is a life of suffering. But the key to Christ's overcoming was suffering. The key to Christ's overcome was sacrifice. That's tough for me to take. But I'll tell you this. Since I've become a Christian, my life has been full of joy, full of, full of excitement, but I've also been heartbroken more than I've ever been in my life. Before I, I loved Jesus, I didn't really care too much about things that were going on in people's life. My sister just called me, and uh, they're going through divorce papers. And my heart broke. I mean, I am just thrashed. And I believe it's the Spirit of God inside me that's just saying, this is sad, this is a time of mourning. A young man approached me at the school. His father began to deal drugs. My heart broke. <sighs> Almost tears in my eyes. Just trying to hug this kid. I don't know what to say to him. And I'm starting to be heartbroken. I'm starting to be sad. I'm starting to understand what Christ went through every single day. Because overcoming like Christ overcame is not an easy thing. But the church of Laodicea said, we want to take the easy way. We want to coast. We want to be lukewarm. We don't want to overcome as he overcame. We don't want to live on that edge, live on that cliff where the true gold is. We want to stay where it's safe. Did Christ stay where it's safe? No, he didn't. Christ would preach in the face of people who wanted to run a spear through his heart. Christ would minister to people who would rather see his head on a platter. Christ walked for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles in practically bare feet so that people could be healed and ministered to. Is that easy? Mm -mm. But that's what overcoming is all about. And I'm not going to tell each one of you to give up everything, quit your jobs, grab a pair of sandals and a walking stick and go live the life that Jesus did in the Middle East and save all the Muslims. I'm not going to tell you to do that. But each one of you knows in your hearts right now, this morning, what it means that Jesus overcame and what it means for you to overcome. And if we're going to be the church that stands aside from Laodicea and says, we're on fire, we overcome like Christ overcomes. But it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be heartbreaking. But the joy and the peace that is there is unspeakable. It's unspeakable. I knew a man, uh, his name was Elipio. And every time it was for vacation, he would save up his vacation time. And he wouldn't go on vacation. Every time it was vacation, he'd save up all his money and go on a missions trip. Every single vacation. Now, vacations are good. I think they're important. We need refreshing. We need to get away. But this guy, he, he ministered to me in the way that Every single time he had a, a free opportunity, he had money, he had a, a, a paid vacation, he would go somewhere and serve in a church. <coughs> he would go to Peru. He would do these things, and it was extreme. And I thought, this guy's crazy. This guy's different. He's a, he's a nut. But you know what, Jesus, today people would call Jesus a nut. I mean, they would call him a freak. The things he did, the policies he lived by, the principles that he stuck to. It says here quite plainly, to him who overcomes the same way I overcame. Hebrews says he walked the path, the path for us as our perfect commander and leader. And now we walk the path behind him. To him who overcomes the same way I overcame, you sit by my hand and we'll fellowship and we'll rule together. That's the key to not being a lukewarm church. The final thing he says here, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I've got an ear to hear, and I'm hearing it. And Jesus is saying, Kev, overcome the way I overcame. Live on the edge. Be an exciting, crazy Christian. Don't sit back. Don't let wealth run your life. Comfort, don't let that run your life. Don't let that be the judge of 
health in your life. I'm comfortable. Sweet. I want to be comfortable. Let me tell you, I love it. When I was in the Philippines, man, it was 90, 90% humidity every single day. It's not comfortable. Sometimes me and my wife, we'd wake up in the morning, lay down on the tile and just lay there. We wouldn't even move our lips. We'd be like, Chrissy, what do you want to do today? Because you move, you're sweating. Some of you guys know you've been there. I love to be comfortable, but that's not the way I measure health as a Christian. I want to be rich. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I want to have lots of money and do lots of things, be creative, have fun. But that's not the way to measure health as a Christian. The simple way to measure health as a Christian is, are we overcoming as Christ overcame? Are we doing that? Are we like those people who planted their village right on the edge so that every day they're taking a step closer just to, to craziness? Are we like that? Are we living like that? Am I living like that? I want to live like that. I do. Last example of overcoming. There's a guy, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. I figure if John the Baptist was here today, he'd get thrown in jail immediately. I mean, <laughs> you would have officials in your city who would put him in a van and take him to the outskirts of town. Because John the Baptist said, I want to overcome. He strapped on a garment that was, you know, it looked like Sasquatch. He, he, he ate locusts, bugs, because he lived off the land where he was called to minister to people. And you know what the ministry that he ministered to them was? It was a ministry of repentance. He instilled change in people's life. He called people to change. And he did it by any means he could. He made, a, he made a spectacle, and people were changed. And so I guess we just have to figure out, are we willing to live on the edge? Are we willing to, to not be comfortable for Christ? Are we willing to sacrifice as Christ sacrificed? And here's the challenge. Tonight, whether you're in a small group or whether you, you go home with your family, look at the life of Christ. Figure out what it meant for Christ to overcome. And then figure out how you're going to model that in your life. Because that's the key to keeping lukewarm aspects out of our church. That's the key to staying on fire. We all stood up and said, we're tired of it. Well, that's the answer. Overcome as Jesus overcame. Follow his, follow his example. And uh, I'll let you guys figure that out today.